You know, back when I was in the academy, we would follow every toast with a song. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Where No Bubs Has Gone Before, a Star Trek Next Generation podcast for fans of the show, hosted by myself, Jay Reckward, and my father, Jake Reckward. We're recording the show for the benefit of my son and Jake's grandson, Ben the Bear, but because we know so many Star Trek fans are out there, we're releasing these for free on YouTube. How are you doing tonight? How are you doing tonight, Jake? I'm good, Jay. And and you? Uh, a little tired, but we'll get through this. Yeah. Uh, we yeah, really exactly. Good, we have a really good episode to talk about. Um, yeah. Tonight we're talking about Star Trek The Next Generation, uh, Season 1, Episode 10. Though it's Episode 10 on Netflix. Officially it's Episode 11 in uh, the production count. Um, this is the episode Haven, which debuted on November 30th, 1987. And, you know, um, I, I think the good thing so far about this season is that each show is getting better. Um especially from moving on from like code of honor. I, I actually like the Haven episode a lot. And w- what do you think and feel about it? Well, this episode and the next one, you know, they're getting more uh, just entertaining mm-hmm. in the science fiction genre. And I think they're kind of finding their pace. The writers were finding their pace. And I think the character develop is uh interesting the relationships between the characters it's interesting yeah i i agree i think there's a lot of um really good acting that's starting to come to the play and yeah the the stories are actually starting to i i think haven's i think one of the reasons why haven is such a good example um it's a much simpler story yes with a much simpler plot line yes it's it's they're all they're becoming much more compelling as they go on yes i agree um let's dig in tonight because there's a there's a lot to discuss um believe it or not despite this being a relatively simple episode sure so the crew of the uss enterprise has arrived to a planet called haven where captain card notes that the planet has been said to mend the souls has been known to uh, mend souls and heal broken bones. I mean, sorry, broken hearts. Um, Lieutenant Commander Data tells the captain that those are legend, that these claims about Haven are legends completely unsupported by facts. And we get into um, kind of the, I think, general discussion of the show. Da- since da- and you made a note of it um, in the notes that you send, which, by the way, are always great. So, uh, Data states there's no evidence to support the legends of Haven, but Picard says legends like these are the spice of the universe because sometimes they have a way of becoming true. Um, and we'll see how that turns out by the end of the episode. And that's and that comment was interesting because it's something we've talked about before. We mentioned legends, how you know there's uh, always questions about the veracity of it, whether it's real or not. But there's always in a legend some possible grain of truth i think the utility of legends within our modern society and even going back into our ancient society um i don't think a a legend necessarily has to be true as much as it has to carry some sort of i think it has to carry a degree of truth in terms of its its connection to the human experience. I think that's a better way to say it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for example, like I grew, you know, growing up as a little boy, um, I love Davy Crockett and there's a lot of legends around Davy Crockett. Right. Um, the truth about Davy Crockett is that the individual was, you know, a very fascinating man who was 
both a um, committed patriot and explorer, but he also did some very terrible things in the time. But the legend of Davy Crockett is one of exploration. It's one of de- it's one of um, steadfastness. It's one of kind of backcountry courage. And ultimately, with the Alamo, it's the story of um, kind of standing your ground even against the toughest odds. Right. And you know, I think those are those things are important because legends legends are somewhat there. I think to you know, we talk about morals and ethics a lot on on this podcast and i think legends in some way help shape the underpinnings of our morals and ethics like we tell the story of um okay do you do you have a legend that you particularly like i can't think of one off the top of my head keep on talking i'll let you know if one pops into mine okay um but you know legends being the the spice of the universe because they somehow have a way of coming true is a very interesting way to set up the show and you know the what happens is that when they finally arrive at haven uh there is a tra- a transporter uh there is a transporter chief that informs the crew that um Haven has approved a beam up of an object that materializes on the transporter pad. Um, When it arrives, it is a strange silver looking chest with a human face on it. Uh, Riker is the first one to appear and ask, you know, what is this? And find it odd. And he finds it odd looking. And then Counselor Troy enters asking what's going on. Interesting enough, the box has a, I think, voice recognition software or some sort of program in that. Um, the box's face opens its eyes and states, I hold a message for Deanna Troy. Luxana Troy and the Honorable Miller family will soon arrive. The momentous day is close at hand. Rejoice. Ha 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 ha. Um, after giving this kind of frightening <laughs> declaration, uh, the face kind of closes again and a hatch opens out of which spills um, a treasure trove of jewels. Uh, Lieutenant Yar, who is also present, asks, what are these for? And Troy reveals that these um, jewels are bonding gifts, or what humans would call wedding presents. When Commander Riker asks who's getting married, Troy tearfully admits, I am. So we have a very much a Troy episode here. And it's really Troy, think, right, a Troy Riker episode, really. True, yeah. Yeah. But this is really kind of the first Troy episode that the show is, you know, really going to commit to. Yeah. There's going to yes. be, a, you know, we've already had a bunch of Riker episodes with yeah, yeah. Counter, Farpoint, and Hide and Q, but this one is yes. kind of strictly Di- Deanna. Right. Um, it's also the first introduction of Luxana Troy, pay- played by the legendary Michelle Barrett, who, of course, was the second wife of. <laughs> Uh, Jean Roddenberry and the first lady of Star Trek. Who was just absolutely fun in her role as L- L- Loxwana Lox- Troy. You know, I, <laughs> I, I want to take a moment and actually talk about Luxana for a second. I, I think that this is a very progressive, kind of startling character when you go back and look at it in 1987, considering some of the social conversations we have today. You have um, a very attractive but older woman who is sexually um, sexually aggressive, loud, brusque, and in many ways exhibits kind of like you know some masculine tendencies. Mm-hmm. But the I, I think that there is something really cool about this character in terms of she kind of has this very liberal sense of sexuality throughout throughout the season and star trek especially tng never really plays up sexuality to in a very big way so having luxana come on the show and be this sort of character and you know michelle barrett plays her perfectly every time out um i i love this character because it's really daring and i i you know it's just a lot of fun she there's so much humor in her and well, it, it's it's interesting because we talked about how Roddenberry wanted to have his own ideas about human sexuality and how it's uh, 
expressed. He right. and his wife must have had some very interesting conversations about how Lakswana, I cannot never say that name, how she would portray that character and with the 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 open sexuality that sex sexuality was something to be celebrated and enjoyed and not hidden at all. Exactly. Um I think Roddenberry is very much um you know, this kind of gets back to our conversation we had previously about, um, I think it was last episode where we talked about, it may have been, no, it may have been before that, where we were talking about, you know, Roddenberry's view of sex. Right. I, th- I think in many ways, Roddenberry has a very libertine viewpoint of sex. I was going to, I was going to um, use that adjective. Yes. Right. Especially for 1987. Uh-huh. Um, but actually, there there are some things that I actually want to get into involving that when it comes to Torellians, but we'll we'll get to that later. Um, so w- one thing that I want to talk about before Riker actually shows up to uh, the transporter room, he's in his room uh, watching two women play harps on his own kind of holographic pad that's centered on a table. And you made a note of that. And I kind of want to discuss that for a second because this is an episode where we see the holodeck used and Riker has his own holographic display. And it's interesting because there there was recently a big debate a few years ago over Star Trek Discovery where they started using holograms a lot on the ship, Discovery, in terms of communications. Like if if they're going to say, they're going to send subspace communications to each other in Discovery... Um, let's say you're on the bridge, a mm-hmm. hologram of me would appear in front of you during that subspace communication. You wouldn't actually talk to me on the view screen. Um, this actually caused a lot of um, controversy among Star Trek fans because Discovery is supposed to be set between um, Captain Archer for Star Trek Enterprise and uh, the first ser- the first original series, uh, and actually, Star Trek uh, Discovery introduces Captain Pike, who will mm-hmm. actually be appearing mm-hmm. in a new spinoff show, um, Strange, Star Trek Strange New Worlds, which hope, which is going to explore um, Captain Pike's tenure as the captain of uh, the Starship Enterprise. But, you know, holograms, I think, have a very interesting place in Star Trek, because on one hand, we, we've always had the holodeck. But there's been cases on different episodes where holographic technology is used in different parts of the ship. And I I think that, you know, the prevalence of this technology is in 87 must have must have seen like such a wondrous thing to have. But today with what we have in terms of virtual reality and some of the things that we're able to do on stage. I don't know if you heard about this. A couple of years ago, a really popular thing was creating holograms of like dead singers and rappers and having Oh yes. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, holographic technology's come a long way. But in nineteen eighty seven, this this must have se- seemed like really cool stuff. Um sorry, go go on. Well you had a little bit of an introduction to the idea in uh, Star Wars. Remember oh, true. in the first one when they showed uh, the holographic image of Princess Leia mm-hmm. putting the putting the chip about the plans for the uh, Death Star into R two R two T R two D two. Yeah, but this was interesting, and I didn't. It, this is kind of jumping ahead, but when you get into the next episode, which is the Big Goodbye, it's yes. all takes place in the holodeck. So in a sense, you know, maybe what the writers were doing is that they were, you know, they were they were kind of introducing, I mean, there was a holodeck, you know, was in this, and I think it's mentioned in some previous episodes in season one, but it's like they're building up to have a, an episode that is pretty much all about the holodeck and so on. You know what, they really, I, it's funny that you mentioned The Big Goodbye, which is the next episode, because mm-hmm. the opening to The Big Goodbye, goodbye is actually Picard talking about how advanced the holodeck has become mm-hmm. um, versus the previous mentions and iterations that we've been presented during the season because we we see the holodeck um, at 
during encounters at Farpoint. Yes, that's right. Because it's Wesley, um, Riker, and Data Mm -hmm. out in the forest um, where we first see Data's crazy strength lifting Wesley out of the water. Um, But the use of the holodeck here, and this is, you know, we'll jump ahead a little bit in terms of this episode. The scene between um, Riker and Troy and then Troy and Wyatt takes place on the holodeck, but that mm-hmm. is a that is kind of a one shot scene mm-hmm. where it, it's kind of just a pretty colorful setting. There's nothing really special or holographic going on. Right, in it. right. It's just it's just a setting. Um, the next episode, like you said, um, will really dive into the holodeck and its full potential. Um, but you know, kind of. You know, one thing that this episode centers around, and I kind of want us to talk about this a little bit here, you know, the the show has always hinted that, and has been very explicit at points, that Riker and Deanna had a previous relationship before um, they arrive on the Enterprise D. And it seems here that this is the first episode since its mention in Encounter at Farpoint, where we really... um, discover the depth of the unfulfilled relationship between Troy and Riker, um, which is mu- which is consummated much, much later um, in Star Trek Nemesis when they marry. And, you know, you made things in your notes that are really important. Like, she ref- she's one of the few people to um, refer to Riker as Will or Bill mm-hmm. in the series. Um, he also calls her Imzadi, which is mm-hmm. a... Um, it is a word, word for yeah. beloved. <laughs> right. And, you know, I've just, just taking a moment to reflect on the Riker-Troy relationship, I've always liked Marina Sirtis and Jonathan Frakes' chemistry together. Um, it's always clear that they're always having fun with each other, and they play, they play the part so intimately that it, it's always one of those things that works on camera. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to hear what you thought about the Riker Troy dynamic. Well, I thought it, this, you know, it did, as you say, it showed um, more depth in terms of what the relationship uh, had been, what it still was. It was sort of, it's sort of an unfulfilled relationship because one of the things that was revealed that Deanna said, I think, to, to Wyatt is that Riker's goal was to be a starship captain. Mm-hmm. So it sort of parallels what we talk, have talked about previously that, uh, you know, Picard as an unmarried captain, that he's pretty much married to the, to the, to the ship. Yeah. In some ways, Kirk was married to the ship, and, uh, but in a different way. And so Riker's kind of following the same path as Picard and there's this feeling that, well, if he were to marry, it would get in the way of him becoming the starship, a starship captain someday. Can, can I make a quick comparison that I never realized until we start, I started re-watching the show for this podcast? Sure. Um, Riker shares a lot more with Kirk than Picard does with Kirk, which the is, of course, impul- intentional. The, the, the impulsiveness, for instance. The, the impulsiveness, kind of the suaveness. The, there's a little bit of... Um, there's always a little bit of a smile on Will Riker's face, just like there's always a little bit of a smile on Kirk's face. Right. Um, and I think both of them are kind of set in that action hero mm-hmm. genre where, you know, as we've discussed, Picard very much is like the diplomat and the ambassador. Right. And, I you know, I, I always think that it's so much easier to put Riker in romantic situations than it is Picard. Mm -hmm. In some ways it's smart because you can keep Picard here for main storylines. And if you need to do a a main romance storyline, you can have Riker. Right. So I think there's some real utility to this character um, in multiple ways. So, you know, one question that you ask your notes is what is genetic bonding? Because it's, it's not Mm -hmm. explained in the show. Mm-hmm. I kind of take that to just be an arranged marriage. Um, they don't really explain it beyond that. And it just seems like this entire situation between the Millers and the Troys is just one big arranged marriage. Yeah, I think that's all it is. But I pointed that out because it was, you know, again, 
put it in terms of 1987 and genetic science was really starting to take off. So did they just throw that in as to make it a little, you know, use a mysterious, somewhat mysterious, unknown scientific term to, uh, you know, just, you know, a different way and an entertaining way to talk about a, a betrothal, basically. Well, you know, one thing that I think that we might explore in terms of what a genetic bonding could be, because, you know, it, it might be just an, a fancy term for an arranged marriage, but, you know, let's explore the idea of an arranged marriage versus, you know, what we usually do now, which are marriages born out of love instead of, you know, um, circumstance or familial obligation. Um I would think that if you would have an agreement between, so this entire mar this entire arranged marriage between um, Wyatt Miller, a young doctor, and Deanna Troy, the the ship's counselor on this on the Enterprise, had was set up between Stephen Miller and Troy's father, who were best friends early on in their childhoods. Right. Part of me wonders if they're using the genetic bonding is if they do some sort of genetic testing on beta Z to, yeah, that's actually, a, to yeah. actually see if there's compatibility because that's a thought. Yeah. You know, Troy's half beta Z. She she's half human. And even Loxana makes a point of saying like, or Troy makes a point of saying like my mother's telepathic powers are far more developed than mine because she's fully beta Z where I'm half beta Z, where I can read people's thoughts and feelings, but I can't, you know, read their minds like my mother can. Mm -hmm. I think that there would have to be genetic testing because on one hand, like, it's very clear that um, Luxana Troy is a royal. She's, she's some sort of monarchical figure. Um, the house of whatever. Yes. Oh, yeah. I will act, I actually want to mm find that uh i actually want to find her full oh yeah i am luxana troy daughter of the fifth house holder of the sacred chalice of reeks and heir to the holy rings of beta Z. who are you <laughs> that's, <laughs> exactly. that's what she actually says right. in haven right um you know i think there's a lot of royal titles and stations there so i wonder if there's a consideration that's somewhere down the line that like Troy would inherit these things. Perhaps. That, yeah. So, and at the same time, if Betazoids really favor people, you know, fool or whoever holds the sacred chalice or whoever is the daughter of the fifth house, maybe they have some sort of genetic <laughs> testing for the bonding because Deanna is, if Deanna and Wyatt produce a child, doesn't it go to only being a quarter beta Z? I'm, I'm tired. My math might be wrong. Yeah. Here. And yeah, then would. what happens to that child's telepathic abilities? Does that child right. retain them? Um, because I asked because, you know, we watched the se the first season of Picard and they show up to the, I forget the planet's name, but Will and Deanna have retreated to a planet after Will's retirement from Starfleet. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And they have a daughter named Kestra um, who doesn't have troy's black eyes which we'll talk about and it doesn't seem that she does she has troy's telepathic abilities or at least during picard and soji's visit to the riker mm -hmm. troy residence it doesn't seem like they establish that she has powers mm -hmm. so i i guess is there a worry that somehow if you dilute a beta z's um genetics down to a quarter they lose their powers um, I don't know. I, th of course, this is all conjecture to what the idea of what genetic bond sure, is. Sure, exactly. Right. Um, so one thing that I, I kind of want to, I'm, I'm trying to use your notes to kind of put together where we're going. And I kind of want to get some of the, so there's a, there's kind of a, interesting nato aspect to the federation that kind of surrounds all this because on one hand the the enterprise is hosting a dignitary in luxana troy they're 
they are also um, attending to the planet of Haven, which has an agreement with the Federation to, for protection in exchange for, I guess, access and membership. And then, as we will discover, there is a Torellian vessel on the way. And, well, let's, let's take a dovetail to talk about the, sorry, talk about the Torellians real quick. Sure. Yes, we need to. Yep. So the Torellians were originally I think they appeared in um, I don't think that they actually appeared in the original series, though they were mentioned. So the Torellians were a humanoid spacefaring um, race native to the planet of Torellia. They at one point attained a level of biotechnology comparable to late 20th century earth and engaged in a civil war where they unleashed uh, a biological, a biological weapon. weapon upon the planet wiping out the civilization because of this plague the Torellians are infected and a lot of them abandon Torellia and they try to go to the stars to find new places to live um unfortunately sometimes they come across planets that are populated and they try to settle down and they of course spread the disease this leads to um multiple civilizations and multiple um i guess star systems whether it's the federation getting to the other to actually either hunt down or uh, extradite the Torellians out of their system. Many of them yeah. actually hunting them down. Yeah, they're totally black blacklisted. They 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 no world wants them because of the infectious agent that they carry. So let you know. Bef- let's talk about the Torellians real quick. Uh, in 1987, what is the conversation around biological weaponry? Was, um, was there because I know you know Saddam is later going to. Um, use scud missiles which were bio which were biological weapons he, he I, I don't know i think that what the iraqis did was they used um more chemical weapons against right. the iranians during the iraq iran war right, and then those are when weapons. when that war was going on and the kurds started to rebel against um the iraqi regime regime against saddam hussein he actually used chemical weapons on several Kurdish towns mm-hmm. and, and just decimated the place. There was some, if people paid attention to, um, you know, the idea of what constituted weapons of mass destruction, the emphasis in the eighties was on nuclear weapons. Yes. However, there was, if you really understood, you know, how it, diverse that could be, there was the idea of you wanted to be able to, uh, protect yourself, NBC, nuclear, biological, and chemical. Mm-hmm. So you had certain, uh, you know, protected fortresses and, you know, command centers that were, uh, could be totally hermetically sealed against both radiation, biological agents, and chemical agents. There was some effort to make, you know, uh, military aircraft and naval ships completely sealable so that they could survive attacks of either, you know, radiation or biological or chemical weapons and so on. So if people there, if people paid enough attention to what the gamut of weapons of mass destruction were, there was some realization that biological agents, um, you know, were were a concern. And if if people really understood what was happening, that, um, you know, the Soviet Union, you know, had biological weapons. I mean, they had, they had a big, I think a in Sverdlovsk, out in the Urals, they had a big accident where they were manufacturing anthrax and it got out and it just decimated, you know, a large area. Mm -hmm. Literally maybe thousands of people died. And it was known that Fort Detrick, Maryland, just north of, uh, just northwest of Washington, D.C. in Frederick, uh, Maryland, that they had a biological weapons lab there too, which was both defensive in nature, but also offensive in nature, because, you know, whenever you get into a situation where one side has a weapon, you have to have a counter to it, just like what happened with mutual issues. Mm-hmm. Oh, 
Oh, you paused. About, um, you know, the gamut of weapons of mass destruction, there would have been some realization that biological weapons were, were, of, were of concern. Yeah. Well, I, you know, one thing that I... One thing that I think people don't take into account when it comes to modern warfare is that we've been especially lucky in some cases that we've only ever dropped two nuclear bombs. Um, you know, as devastating as the bombs were at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and they really are a dark point in human history, um, we really haven't had a war in modern times that have used chemical or biological agents to large effect. Now, Syria is a different, you know, Syria, right. that's, that's the Assad regime using chemical weapons on their own people. Right. Um, that's just blatantly evil. But that's, that kind of falls out of the purview of war. Um, I think, you know, chemical warfare was a really big deal in World War I, which is why people's kind of stopped using chemical weapons because they realized, you know, it's really is a no-win scenario to drop a mustard gas bomb into a trench because you can't mm -hmm. go into that trench afterwards for a while. Um, but, you know, I, th I think Star Trek is, is a good show because they play with the idea of what would really happen if you know, someone was stupid enough like the Torellians to actually engage in biological warfare. You know, the, there was some discussion in during the, um, you know, in the in the um, conference room, in the ready room, where they actually talked about when they were describing who the Torellians were and why they were uh, uh, pariahs. And they made the comment is that how could somebody be so stupid to do what they did? Mm -hmm. I mean, they actually used that term. Well, it's, is it's, this is an always, this is always a scary question I ask when it comes to like the advancement of war in history. Was it stupid before they did it? Mm. Um, because it's always easy to say it's, it was stupid for the Torellians to do it in hindsight, but like someone had to make the decision somewhere along the line that like a biological weapon was a, appropriate response to whatever sort of regression or whatever sort of stimulus they were facing to react in such a violent pro you know destructive manner because it, it really it, is a weapon of mass destruction it um that's a good question because you know i mean going back to chemical use of chemical weapons phosgene mustard gas chlorine gas during world war one it was used and um, the consequences of using it, the long-term effects on uh, soldiers was seen. And it was then sort of a, um, you know, almost a, a moral decision that they were gonna be outlawed, that they weren't gonna be used. And, you know, there's still, you know, there probably still are some chemical weapons around because, you know, tactically, the use of chemical weapons is not necessarily to kill your enemy's troops, but is to create mass casualties mm -hmm. so that you just, you know, would take a fighting force and make it totally, totally dysfunctional. I mean, look at how much concern there was during the first Iraq war. Mm hmm and there's even concerns now that I heard something on the radio last week that there's a lot of Iraq war veterans, uh, you know, from the first Iraq war, when they were giving certain drugs that would counter effect, counter, uh, uh, counteract the effect of the nerve agents that they suspected or that the, they thought the Iraqis had and would use, mm -hmm. that those, a lot of those soldiers may be suffering, you know, some sort of, you know, uh, uh, long-term toxic effects from those from those anti-nerve gas agents that they were given. Mm. So it just shows you where you know if the immediate effect was you know you didn't necessarily have to kill the troops, but if you just created mass casualties, you would function in a, a fighting force non-functional. 
or dysfunctional. It makes you wonder how bad the situation for the Torellians had gotten that they decided to use that. Because, you know, um, Beverly makes Beverly Crusher um, makes the point that you know anyone and with you know just a little bit of scientific background and some knowledge um, could grow a deadly disease or virus and create a weapon. Um, you know they they alluded to uh, the Torellians getting to a twentieth century a late twentieth century level of science to be able to create these things. Um, I, I just have to wonder, you know, we, we know that Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons. We know that Assad uses chemical weapons. I, you just have to wonder what goes through the minds of people that well, decide I mean, that this is a viable option. You know, shift over to biological weapons, since that is what caused the Torellians' uh, si right. uh, situation. I mean, now that we're in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic still, you know, what, how is that going to affect world governments and military tacticians and so forth in terms of, oh, you know, we've got this virus, a couple of vials of it stored away somewhere in secret, you know, is it something we really might want to consider using or um, looking at the, not just, it, it, I mean, it, it, the, as far as we know, China is not, did not release the virus as a bioweapon because there seems to be more information coming out that it, the impact of the disease was much more prolific than reported. Uh, and, but they did control it very well because of their authoritarian society. They could lock, they really could lock yeah. Wuhan down tightly and so forth. But just looking at the social damage um, the economic damage, the damage to children and education are those people who are responsible for looking at this, you know, have the experience of thinking, this is something we absolutely should not do. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, where a story like this, uh, if it gets out there and it's told, it's something that would make people think as to whether, you know, we have this capability but should we use it? Mm. And I think there's a lot of things that advances in science come along that there has to be a decision by scientists whether it's responsible to use it. I, I can't think of other examples like this, but I remember my freshman year of college, we had a, um, we had a spring term mm -hmm. where you took one or two courses only. And I took a course, now I, this is interesting to mention, on the history of science. Oh, wow. And I had to write a paper about how uh, carbon dating worked. But one of the books we had to read, and we didn't, I, don't, I can't remember that whether we had to write a book report, was called The Social Responsibility of the Scientist, mm -hmm. which was a very good book. Mm -hmm. Because if somebody was going to go into science, it was sort of like, <laughs> the lesson was perhaps, don't become Frankenstein. Yeah. So, you know, I think the invoking Shelley's classic novel, um, I think the problem with, I think the lesson of Frankenstein is not only, you know, you need to be responsible, but you also need to ha keep yourself within a moral and ethical boundary. Yes. Um, and there, you know, science has to have some sort of agreement that there are just some things that you don't explore. Um, in case of Frankenstein, you know, you shouldn't be cutting up bodies, stitching them together and trying to reanimate someone in Star Trek. Maybe you shouldn't be developing biological weapons. Well, he, well, here's a good one. I mean, there was concern that when the first atomic bomb test was done on July 6, oh, right. 1945 at Trinity, there was concern as to whether it would set the atmosphere on fire and destroy the human right. race. Yeah. And, and, and. And it didn't, as we know, because we're still here. But, you know, that was like, I mean, what was Oppenheimer and, you know, thinking about that just beyond, you know, him saying that I will become the destroyer of worlds. <laughs> he was just standing there quoting Krishna like, fuck, I did this. <laughs> um, exactly. Well, you know, also, God, 
I just had it on top of my head because you brought up Oppenheimer. Um, who came up? Ah, it it's gone. But you know, I I think one aspect of science that is is brought to the forefront here in Haven is how do you deal actually with the aftermath of something terrible as the Torellians infecting themselves with this this plague because what happens is that the Torellians suddenly appear over Haven uh, initially looking for a place to land because the legend says you know Haven is this place of healing and when we first see the Torellians, there's only eight of them left. We'll, we'll talk about who the Torellians are specifically in terms of characters when we get there, but there's only eight Torellians left when they show up on the ship. But the reaction to the Torellians by both um, the Enterprise and um, the home government of Haven is especially telling in terms of how devastating the actual plague the Torellians care have or carry, or I'm sorry, the actual plague the Torellians are carrying is. Um, for example, the the government of Haven basically wants the um, Enterprise to destroy the Torellians outright. Right. If, well, as soon as they get, they're very fearful that as soon as the Torellian ship gets within uh, transporter range that they could beam down to the planet and the government leader, whatever her title was, really directly suggests that this enterprise destroy the ship before that yes. point. Here, um, there was... She had a title. I'll, I'll find her, but um, the, the one thing is interesting, though, is Picard's reaction, because on one hand, he... He agrees that there is a responsibility to like protect Haven from the Torellians. But on the other hand, Starfleet is bound to help um, civilizations or groups or species in need. And he, you know, it seems while the government of Haven is openly hostile to interacting with the Torellians in any way, it seems Starfleet still has this view that, okay. We, we can't really deal with these people face to face, contact to contact. How do we still have to find some sort of way to be of service to them, especially if they're suffering? And I, I think that's a very interesting um, philosophical bent when we talk about the NATO aspect of the Federation, where on one hand, they do have to be kind of the peacekeeper in the area, but at the on the other side of it, there is very much this kind of, I, I want to use the word philanthropic, but that's not the right one. There's, um, there's very much this altruistic outreach by the Federation to make sure that people are treated better than when they arrived. Because, you know, the, the Enterprise could just tractor tractor beam the Torellians away from the planet and just drop them off someplace in the distance because the ship is noticeable, notably inferior to the Enterprise. It doesn't even have um, warp drive when it shows up. It's traveling sub-warp. Yeah, exactly. Um, right. And we later found out it's because so many people on the ship died and there's really only eight of, eight of them left. But, you know, one of the things that they try to do, the crew, is figure out a way, okay, how are we going to help the Torellians? And that gets us into um, Wyatt and mm -hmm. kind of the real crux of I, the episode in terms of is there is, you know, Wyatt comes on the ship holding these pads of these drawings he's made of this beautiful blonde woman that he's seen since he was a child. And in, according to him, he's been speaking to um, this woman. Ar Ariana. Ariana. Right. Yeah, Ariana. Um, he's been speaking to her since uh, they were children. And he actually shows up to Haven with the expectation that somehow he's going to meet her there. And that, it's that the woman he's meeting to marry is actually Ariana and not Troy. He 
he even makes a comment when he uh, uh, when he meets Troy and explains who this woman is that De- Deanna realizes that Wyatt is not finding what he expected when he meets her that he holds these deep long abiding feelings for this Torellian woman uh, and despite but despite that though Trill, um, Troy is still willing to marry him in many ways, this story is a story about love of first sight. Mm-hmm. But love of first sight is connected strangely to this idea that Luxana talks about when it comes to all consciousness being linked mm-hmm. together. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to try to find the quote because there's a, it was a great quote. Yes, you're right. Uh, yeah. As you're looking for it, she she makes the statement. Wide says, "I always thought it would be that way," and then she basically says something to confirm it. It's yes. almost it, it's almost like uh, the Force in Star Wars. Yeah. Well, um, she makes. Uh, you know what? I'm having a really hard time finding. It. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna kill ourselves over it. Um, right. But she basically makes the point that, like, throughout the universe, all of us are connected somehow through our consciousness. And you know, you ask the question in your notes: Is this a definition of God? I'm not necessary. I'm not necessarily sure that all consciousness is linked together from the Betazoid viewpoint Nece- necessitates there being a god. Because I think that there would be a storytelling element somewhere down the line, and it just seems like the Betazoids, these dark-eyed Betazoids, um, just have this belief that every, th- every consciousness in the universe is intractably linked together. Um, do you think that there needs to be, do you think that this is a definition of God or maybe some sort of different realization of consciousness or different definition of it? You know, I, I you know, just like you asked me an example of a legend, I'm trying to think of an example where there seems to be a destiny for individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, that interact such a way in a positive way that advances society, that advances mankind. And unfortunately, I can't think of any good example offhand, but it's like, um, you know, that, that, that's, that's what it sort of brings up is that, you know, do, when things just gel together and some synergy comes of it that again produces a, a positive advancement in some way. Is that just total serendipity? Is it total chance? Or are there certain, you know, if you look at human existence as a stream, are there certain eddies that are just going to come together and put the right materials together? You know, to, to, to make it really kind of you know, um, an extreme example, you know, was there, <laughs> what was the destiny of the chemistry of um, ancient, ancient earth when the first amino acids formed? Right. And, you know, the thought is that recently with all the discussion about the pandemic and so forth and in viruses, I guess this was in a National Geographic article last month big in-depth article on viruses is that maybe viruses may have been the first life form. Yeah. Well, and, and, and then they congregated into single cell organisms and so on. Well, there, there's a, there's actually a really big discussion within um, science and part of it is, and part of Star Trek, it takes a lot of time to explore this idea of, maybe life has alternate definitions outside of the typical biological ones of, you know, it has to be able to respirate, reproduce. Um, I, I think it has, to, 
I'm forgetting some of them because it's late, but I think it has to be able to consume and something mm-hmm. else. And but those are kind of very those are the definitions of bi- biological life. Um, you know, Star Trek also deals with the idea of like sil- silicate life. Can, can so you based as opposed to carbon, right? Yes. Um, also, kind of energy. You know, I was going to mention energy. That. Yeah, right. Um, be considered sentient and intelligent, and their own form of life. Uh, the idea of viruses coming together is probably not that far fetched or out there either. Um, well, and that gets into you know you talk about beings being consistent, chiefly of energy, and if they're if such were to exist in their conscious, you know, what is consciousness in our bodies? Is it basically electrochemical energy anyway? Yeah. And to get down to a more granular level, what is consciousness to a virus versus consciousness to a bacteria versus consciousness to the host body it both of those reside in? Like, you know, Cells have a process of reproduction, um, energy transference, and ultimately cell death. Uh, and it's part of a cycle of you know re- renewing our, our cells within our body to keep ourselves relatively fun- functional. And part, part of the things that happens when we die is that our cells are no longer going through that reciprocal process of regenerating. Is there a consciousness to a single cell organism? Not necessarily, I think, therefore I am, but, you know, what is the definition of consciousness in terms of, okay, you know, if, if the definition of life is that you need to be able to procreate, is that a conscious thing? Or is it like if two bacteria get together and create more bacteria, is that a conscious thing that they're doing or is consciousness, I guess what I'm asking is that, is there free will to consciousness or does consciousness have to contain free will for it to be considered, um, I guess, uniform and independent in terms of being able to perceive something? Well, to, to bring that back to the, to the story, um, you know, if there is a, if Lakswana says, talks about that there's this universal consciousness, then that's somehow in this story is what is linking Wyatt to Ariana and Ariana to Wyatt so that they had visions of one another so that they could draw very accurate pictures of one another, even as they advanced in years from childhood to a doll. Um, so, you know, it, it really, it does, it brings, it, it brings up that question. I don't think we're going to be able to answer it tonight and so forth, but you know, it's, a, it's, it's, again, it's one of these things where you get into a science fiction story and you really drill down and look at what's being said. It just will foment a lot of good thinking about things. Yeah. Well, another part of the story that I think, you know, getting away from consci- consciousness, it also is very much a love at first sight story. Mm-hmm where it's very clear that Wyatt has been pining for this woman and Ariane has been drifting through the stars expecting to meet this young man. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting that we talk about consciousness and free will and then destiny because in, in some ways, all three of these things are contradictory to each other. Because, you know, if, if, Wyatt, are in, if Wyatt and Ariane are destined to be together, they really don't have a choice about it but they clearly do make choices to get where they're going. But at the same time, like they're, everyone is still able to make their own decisions in terms of how they react to the situation at hand. You know, why it doesn't have to make the decision to beam over to the Torellians. He just does. Um, Troy doesn't have to necessarily accept the Miller's marriage proposal, but she just does because it's Betazoid tradition. Right. You know, there's, when we talk about things like consciousness and um, free will and destiny, it, it really does get into a, psych, 
a philosophically and psychologically muddy area where, like you said, we're not going to figure it out in one episode, but I don't think, I think part of life is trying to clear up that muddiness a little bit between what is, you know, what are we doing with our consciousness and how much of it is free will and how much of it is destiny. Yes. And if there is such a thing as destiny, what does that really say about the course of our lives and maybe our existence um exactly yes it's it's very well you know um star trek does a lot of things with time and time travel and you know one constant theme that you see in science fiction built around um temporal anomalies or time travel is that if you change something in the past you irrevocably alter the future right so you know if destiny is set in motion in terms of a timeline until a moment where the timelines change was that destiny really (laughs) destined or was the destiny to change the timeline see you get into a very difficult question here it's it's a bunch of conundrums that you never really yes right can really solve but right maybe life like, like I said, maybe life is the the pursuit of fi- of figuring them out for yourself. Because it, in the end of this episode, Wyatt knows that like his life has been building up to not only be with Ariani, but also to go and try to help cure the last eight Torellians there are. Um, yeah, he has no idea as to what his destiny is. He thinks his destiny is to marry Deanna because of the 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 the, the uh, betrothal that goes back to his childhood mm-hmm. but then when he um, you know come, when he he you know sees the Torellians on their vessel and Ariana reveals herself and he thus reveals herself to her it all makes sense to him right away it just clicks and yes. at that point he really knows exactly what he's going to do and even Troy knows there, there's a point where like Troy is on the bridge standing next to him. And it's a very telling scene. Right. Where like they're why and Ariani are talking for the first time. And I think even Troy knows deep down inside, like, well, this marriage is over. <laughs> That's right. Ball game. Right. Well, there's also, I think maybe a little bit of, you know what? Tr- Troy's reaction to Wyatt leaving with the Torellians is on one hand, like he, she, she's very happy that she's he's found ariani but there also seemed to be a little disappointment because it seems through the episode that troy's actually warming up to wyatt because wyatt's actually a nice young man who's very smart yeah she sees the but she sees the possibility of a good relationship with him she's very respectful of her culture Mm -hmm. and the and the agreement her parents made so yeah but it you know again it gets into how do we determine our own destinies for troy her destiny is very much cultural where it, it, that says something about the betazoid um traditions versus i think you know why it is you know why it's a human so why it has this very different conception of destiny than i think deanna does and i think that's demonstrated throughout the show wait yeah i want mean- I read something this kind of fits in with this because you mentioned what choices do you make yeah i talked to you about this uh book that i found prisoners of geography by right tim marshall in the very end the last paragraph of the conclusion uh i wonder where whether he's going to say about you know talking about geography on the planet earth whether he's going to talk about geography in a larger sense in the solar system in space and he does And the last paragraph is, when we are reaching for the stars, the challenges ahead are such that we will perhaps have to come together to meet them. To travel the universe, not as Russians, Americans, or Chinese, but as representatives of humanity. But so far, although we have broken free from the shackles of gravity, we are still imprisoned in our own minds, confined by our suspicion of the other. There. And thus our primal competition for resources, there is a long way to go. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I talked to you a little bit, you know, 
after the last podcast about this book and it's a very good book. Yes. You're getting, I've sent you that information, but you know, the thing that I got from it is that, yeah, um, geography has caused various countries to have mindsets of how they react in the world. However, each country has a choice as to whether they want to continue on that path mm-hmm. or whether they want to behave differently. Yeah. A, a, good, a good example is, are you going to accept climate change and deal with it? Yes. Well, you know, one, and I haven't read the book and I, I, I definitely want to now. And that quote that you read from the last paragraph was beautiful. It succinctly sums up so many things. Um, you know, one thing about geography is that a lot of human civilization has had the choice to migrate if the geography wasn't working for them. So, you know, that, that in itself is a decision that has huge ramifications in terms of the development of a species. Just the, be, just the ability to move out of your own locality um, gives you it not only ex- it exposes you to huge risks but if you have the ability to actually move out of your locale and survive and thrive evolutionarily speaking you have such a huge advantage over so many other things um in the world that you deal with that it, it really can't be understated the point you just made with that last paragraph there really is kind of you know, destiny is shaped by our ability to move in ways that we don't expect. And it, it seems here, um, using the argument that this book presents with geography, destiny is very much built with the decisions that we make r- regarding how we respond to the natural world around us immediately. And in some ways, I think in the future of Star Trek, kind of getting away from geography and getting back to the episode, mm-hmm. there's very much a discussion of like, okay, how do we deal with the cosmos? Maybe not in a physical way, but how do we deal with the cosmos in a social way to make this make this very risky place full of tons of danger, full full of ton of danger. I'm sorry, filled with tons of dangers and um, hostile alien races. How do we make this work? Um, for the races that don't want to be hostile, that want to yes. try to well, live that, in a larger universe that is more beneficial than it is. Well, and that gets natural. back to the whole to the whole NATO aspect of this mm-hmm. episode, where one of the questions I came up with after I wrote my notes is, since Starfleet has a military aspect to it, in, in some of the, the, you know, in the later episodes, you have the conflict with the Cardassians and you have the Dominion War and you have the board to deal with and so on and so forth. Is, is, does Starfleet actually have a military industrial complex aspect to it? And, be, and it does that because it has to defend the Federation against these hostile forces. And, it, and it's sort of a, an evolutionary cycling where, you know, the Terrans as sort of the leaders in forming the Federation and they take the NATO approach, let's, let's do things together. Let's have a common defense. Let's try to help one another and so on. They, are, they, they, are, they accomplish that, but then as they go out and explore and they make contacts with other civilizations, other races that don't have the same philosophy, then they get in a position that they have to have a certain degree of the military industrial complex in a, in, in a, in a, in a way. But it seems to me is that what they want to try to do ultimately is, you know, evolve the galaxy toward what the, rep, the Federation represents. So it's like, you know, if it gets into, you know, the whole concept of the military industrial complex in our world today, I think to some extent it's out of control. Oh, yeah. And as a matter of fact, since I like to watch Bill Maher on uh, 
HBO on Friday nights. He had John Tester on, the Democratic senator from Montana, and he challenged him on that and said, look, if you look at, we've spent $1.7 trillion on this damn F-35. I was going to bring some, up the F-35. <laughs> and some people think it's, it's, it's a piece of shit. It's not accomplishing, you know, it's not performing the way we, we want. And that gets into the whole idea of get back to choices. Um, you know, if you have to have a military, um, do you, again, you make choices as to how far you go with it. Um, you know, what's its mission? Do you have enough to serve its purpose? Or do you always have to, <laughs> the problem with, the, with what Eisenhower said is, look, you know, this, is, this has become, you know, it's a self-feeding monster. And, and you know, yeah. it only becomes that because you make bad choices. You make bad decisions. I, I think it's... <laughs> I, I fully agree with that, that it comes down to that you make bad choices, but you make bad decisions. But I also think it also comes down to like what you, f what function you're trying to fit by creating it. And, and, and the last comment I would make, I think it, at least in the 24th century, the way yeah. Starfleet is established, it's, there's, it's not part of the military industrial complex. They haven't, I don't think it's out of control. I, I think there's so much more civilian involvement in Starf Starfleet than there is in our current military industrial complex. And I think that's really the problem. There's right. really no civilian oversight. And, you know, kind of the, well, this, this has everything to do with military industrial complex. One problem that we have in current policing here in the, in the country is that um, a, lot of the, a lot of these police forces are being funded and equipped by large weapons manufacturers that also help um, supply the military. So if you have a system where you're giving people weapons and tanks and body armor and all these things, it, at some point spending all this money to create things that no one has real use for, like, you know, we're not having riots every day in every city in America. So like, you don't need to break out the flak vest and the riot gear every day so that riot gear sitting on a shelf someplace you know it, it comes to the question of like why are you doing this and what's your what's your real end game why are you selling a tank to a police yes. force yes what does that Ar police force Ar need yeah yeah Ar armored vehicles and so forth yeah, but getting exactly. back to the military industrial complex what's the point of it is it is it to better the military is it to better society or is it to build what is it to keep building weapons because you know the military industrial complex that we built coming out of world war ii was transitioned from you know we transitioned the the industrial sector of the country over to over from creating consumer goods to creating military goods you know, we didn't stop that because we were obviously right after World War II in competition with Russia for an arms race. The question becomes like, okay, if you set up a military industrial complex to compete with Russia, which you have to because they're going to create weapons that are just as big and just as bad, or at least they're going to try to. Um, when that's done, what's the point of having this complex if you've won? Like, if you don't have anyone to build weapons against, why are you still building weapons? It, it just becomes a question of what is the real function of the structure that we have in place? And I think if, um, Eisenhower was really trying to warn us of that. He's like, look, you all are sitting here looking at this thing, thinking that it's this great thing that's making you money and giving you jobs. But like, at the end of the day, the military industrial complex is there to perpetuate itself. But, well, it's there to perpetuate weapons of war. Like, right. let's, let's talk about what they're creating. The military industrial complex creates a lot of wonderful things, but at the end of the day, they're building weapons of war. It, you know, if you don't have a war, why are you building weapons? If you, if you don't have a war and you don't have a need to build weapons, why are you paying all these people to research how to build new weapons? You know, it becomes a question of what is the actual intent here? And I think, as you know, and it gets back to the NATO aspect, 
I, I think in the future there is, I think there's clearly a, a type of industrial complex in Starfleet because they have to build ships and they have to, sure, yes. they have to keep pushing forward, especially since, you know, there are the Romulans out there that are their me- immediate competition who, you know, it seems the Romulans, every time they're depicted, they're, it seems the, the entire Romulan economy is built on their own military industrial complex. Um, which actually creates problems for them later on in the in the movie. Well, and, and and that's my point is if you have an adversary that you have to adjust to, you may not consciously or, or, or yeah, you may not be making the decision to perpetuate a military com- military industrial complex, but because you have an adversary that does, you have to do so, and that's what's happened on this planet now still Mm -hmm. and you know there's there's you know one of the questions is or one of the strategic things is look at do you build weapons based upon your experience in the last war or do you want to build weapons that you're going to be useful to fight or defend yourself in the future war and um i mean the whole thing of nuclear weapons if there is an acceptance of mutual assured destruction, then why don't we, you know, do we really need them? I mean, you know, the U.S. only has, I read an article the other day, we've got like 6,000 nuclear weapons stockpiled. Mm -hmm. Only 1,700 are active. Yeah. The Chinese have about 340, 400. Mm -hmm. The Russians probably have a similar number based on treaties that are active weapons and any of the weapons like in the, the ICBMs that are still left in the Dakotas, they're targeted out at places out in the ocean. They're not, we're not targeting yeah. as far as we know onto Russia or Beijing and vice versa. So it's like, well, the, yeah, you know, it, but, and what's the big threat? I mean, is, is, is the cyber attacks, that's where we need to be spending money, not on freaking F-35s, probably. Well, let's get back to the F-35 for a second. The problem with the F-35 is that it's an outdated weapon. Like, if, if we're going to have wars in the future, we might have some sort of aerial combat. But, like, you know, bombings are, you know, you don't use necessarily um, fighter jets anymore to deliver, bomb, to deliver bombs. You can launch them with a Predator drone. So you don't yes. even need a human pilot there at at the scene of the bombing. You can have someone in a right. trailer in Texas, you know, ten thousand miles away. It it really kind of the F thirty five. I'm glad you brought it up because it really begs the question: after one point seven trillion dollars, why were you still putting so much money into essentially an outdated, outmoded piece of equipment? You know, it's like the um. I understand people are really excited and it's, it's funny. We're talking about star Trek because um, top top gun is also at paramount just mm. like star Trek, but you know, there's a new there, there will hopefully be a new top gun film uh, coming out, but they're not flying. They're not flying around the F 14 Tomcats anymore because those things are outdated. Right. I, I think that we got into a situation with the F 35 where we just kept putting money into something that literally has no use. In, in it the gets modern, to the point that in the you put world. so much money into it, you can't stop because it'll. You don't want to admit to yourself that you totally failed. And maybe you know, getting back to our conversation about the Torellians use of biological weapons, maybe the Torellians got to the point where they just built up their military industrial complex to where they got to the point that they kind of force themselves into using biological well, weapons they definitely made a bad choice exactly um and that choice has real consequences uh so let's let let's finish up the episode by talking about some of the more fun things sure um i love mr home who's playing oh, yes <laughs> yes it, this is the only episode, to my knowledge, where he speaks. Right. Thank you for the drinks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was such a good line. That uh, He was played by uh, Carol Strookin, uh, 
who was also famous for being a lurch in the Adams family. That's right. Yeah. Okay. But it, great character. I always love Mr. Holm. Uh, yes. He, he does. He's he has really great comedic timing and his mm-hmm. interaction with Data in particular. Yes. I yes. actually wanted to stop because and and look at this for a second because we're going to get to the Data Lore episode in this mm-hmm. series and that that's a really important episode for Data. Mm-hmm. But I find it interesting that like Data is so entertained by rude human and alien <laughs> interactions during the um, yes. pre-wedding dinner or the pre- yes, I love it. I love it. He enjoys right. Eddie bickering to the point where he's like, "Could you please continue?" Yes, I I find it so uh, endearing because there is a part of us as humans that we do like watching people bicker and be petty to each other. Right. As much as we say we don't, we do. And it's, I think it's interesting for an android who is so bent on trying to discover his own humanity that he can find entertainment in it. Yes. Do you know what I think the secret to Data is, Dad? Go ahead. He's already human. Just everyone around him, including him, just doesn't know it yet. Yes, you're, yeah, you're probably right. And, exactly and probably the only person that really knows that he's human is his creator um dr sung dr sung yes uh but i you know that's my big data theory he's already human they mm-hmm. just don't know it mm-hmm. um let's see <laughs> what do you think of tasha yar's hair oh i thought that she was putting on the ritz for the dinner yeah I I found it so interesting like they do so many weird things in that scene to like kind of class it up yes you know, like this is a wedding dinner like she puts mousse in her hair Beverly for some reason puts her hair back in a bun right like, there, there's just a lot of <laughs> and they're sitting in this kind of weird mess hall that we never see again on the Enterprise we never right. see them eat in a place like this um, we, we do see a lot of 10 forward though um, which I don't. Well, well, back to the dinner. I think is entertaining oh, yeah. because, in addition to, um, Data walking around with a shit eating grin on his face about enjoying the petty bickering that's going on, it's like, at one point, you know, Tasha just laughs at it too, but it's like Beverly sitting next to the card and she's watching all this stuff going on, and it's like they're both kind of not looking at each other, but the looks on their faces is like. What the hell is going on here? It's a, it's a very wonderful scene. I really like um, Luxana's um pet. pet plant. Yes. Yeah, I find that so fascinating, though. Like, in the future, that we have somehow we have either discovered or we have genetically created a creature. Well, that was just a that was just a beta Z thing, you know. Yeah. That they had but, on beta Z, right? But I find that to be really. I actually found that creature to be very interesting and wanted to see more. Yes. Of it. Yeah. Um. One thing that doesn't actually get looked at at all. We don't actually go down to the planet of Haven to discover anything about the healing powers. Right. We don't. Which you know is kind of like leaving Chekhov's gun on the mantle. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, let's talk about this. Let's talk about Picard's dual role here to end, to end the episode. You know, on one hand, he has to protect Haven, and on the other one, he has to help the Torellians. How do you think he handles that? Even I think though why did. it takes it out of his hands later on. I think he does a good job because he's very clear that. Um, he realizes that he has the responsibility to Haven to protect them based on the treaty that the Federation has with Haven. And at the same time, he, you know, by um, applying the tractor beam to make sure they don't come within uh, transporter range, he buys himself time to figure out how, how they can be helped. One thing that I wanted to ask you, um, because there's very much a there's very much a phobia and fear presented by both the inhabitants of Haven and the Enterprise crew when it comes to the Torellians because the Torellians are, are carrying around this plague. Um, in the 80s, the AIDS epidemic is really exploding at this time. 
and it it's really it's particularly bad because the Reagan administration is doing nothing to address it at all. Um, I have to ask you, in 1987, like, what was the AIDS conversation really like, and what were people really feeling about it? Because it's depicted sometimes in documentaries and books as this very scary time, and definitely a very scary time for the LGBTQ community um, who felt the greatest impact of, of this virus and disease. But I, I just wanted to ask you from your perspective, having lived through it, like, I mean, the, the virus was around it. Yeah, the virus really was discovered in 82, 83. And, you know, the gay community in uh, New York and Los Angeles, more Los Angeles, really. Mm -hmm. But by 87, uh, there was still some fear about it because it really, a lot of people didn't understand how it was transmitted. You know, it was uh, transmitted by sharing of bodily fluid, mainly, you know, uh, blood, because some people who received blood transfusions that people that were HIV positive contracted HIV. And of course, by, by intimate sexual, sexual con, uh, contact. But I think there was a, there remained until probably well into the 90s, there was a lot of public that just feared it. They felt like, well, if this person has AIDS and I kiss them or I touch them, I'm going to get it. And it feels like there's somewhat of that being touched on here in this episode when it comes to the Torellians, because there really is this kind of existential fear all around that, the, that if you come in contact with the Torellians, you're kind of done. Yeah, and 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 we and at the same time, it, there's a kind of an information gap because, especially with every some people being very aware of how virus is transmitted now because of the pandemic. You know, is it air? Is it through the air? Is it through fomites? Is it through touch and so forth? We really don't know how. We don't even know. I, did, is it mentioned them as a virus that they're carrying, no, or actually, it's just a, they, they don't actually? So, they just say a plague. They just say a plague. So we yeah. don't know what we're dealing We don't know what they were really dealing with in theory. Um, you know, kind, kind of stay on the AIDS thing for a second. Um, you worked in medical, tra you worked in um, tissue transplantation and tissue donation for right. many, many years. And I have to imagine at some point you've run across people that have worked in hematology and also worked in like blood banking. When HIV AIDS came around in 82, 83, what was the immediate fear in terms of blood, you know, um, blood collection, blood donation, making sure people had blood transfusions? Like, was, it, was there an immediate panic in terms of like, you know, could, can we trust all these bags of blood that we have in this freezer? Are, are they potentially... Or was it? Or were they able to isolate and identify the HIV virus early enough that they were able to prevent it from? No, I don't remember the exact time frame, but you know, after the syndrome showed up because it was called, you know, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. That's what AIDS stand for. Yeah. They didn't know what the causative agent was, and then it was a French scientist and somebody at uh, NIH that. You know, there's questions of who really discovered it first, but they found that it was, you know, a virus that was causing the disease. They then quickly started to see that 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 AIDS was showing up in um, recipients of blood, mm. and they then you know they realized that oh, it's being transmitted that way. It's a bloodborne pathogen. So alongside of that, what has to happen is they had to come up with a diagnostic test to determine whether an individual was infected with the virus. And they came up with the first test with something called ELISA, which stood for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, hmm. which, which, is, which is still used, ELISA is still used. There are better, better tests now called nucleic acid tests that looks for the actual nucleic acid of the uh, Mm -hmm. uh, virus, but um, you know, I can't remember the exact time frame, but yeah, as soon as it started realized that the virus was being transmitted by blood donations, then you know there was very rapid work done to develop a diagnostic test so that blood donors could be screened, and then tissue donors, cornea donors, and so forth, organ donors could be screened uh, also. 
What kind of conversations were you having in your industry when this was happening, if any? Well, there was a lot of conversation with the um, between the organ and tissue transplant organizations, uh, with the Centers for Disease Control and the Food and Drug Administration. Wow. Okay. Um, did you, you know this is kind of a personal question, but back in the eighties, eighties, no one knew what AIDS was. Did you and mom have any fear of it? Because I, I asked because. You know, Margo and I are living with Ben in the middle of COVID, and COVID in itself is its own pandemic, and the AIDS is, has been its own pandemic, well, epidemic. Um, what was your general reaction to it when it was coming? No, I, I think that it was because it was so strongly defined as a gay disease in mm. the beginning, and since we were, you know, had, you know, we're heterosexual, uh, I was not gay, mom was not gay, etc., we didn't have any concern about it. And so then, you know, once it, the research, you know, the clinical data became available and they understood that the disease was transmitted, uh, you know, through, mainly through blood, blood and, uh, you know, uh, semen and, you know, um, uh, fluids related with, related to sexual practices and so on, that, once that became understood by some people, there, you know, since we understood that, we never became fearful of it. Again, mm -hmm. we're others who didn't understand the science behind it and just said, well, th this is a gay thing. And I don't under, I really don't understand how it's transmitted, even though information was there. That's where there were some people that were very fearful of just getting it by being in contact with somebody that was gay and so forth. And it seems like, you know, part of the fear that I think is relevant in the Haven episode is, is, is kind of mirroring maybe some of the fear that's going on in 87. Um, one final question I have to ask, and then we'll, we'll transition. How did you feel about the Reagan administration's response to it when it happened? Personally, personally, it didn't it didn't concern me very 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 much, because um, um, you know I understood that you know I it, it kind of because of the business I was in the sector I was in, I had to understand what was going on. I knew that it was bloodborne, and that if you could screen donors, you know, for the for the virus that you, there could, there could be a safety built in so that people continue to have organ transplants and tissue transplants and that sort of thing. So I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to, you know, the social stigma that the Reagan administrative may have helped foment. It's interesting because I, I asked this question because within the, within the history of the LGBTQ community, um, Reagan has a very pronounced role in it, especially when it comes, because AIDS is a very big deal in that community, even today, especially when mm -hmm. it comes to um, the widespread use of PrEP to suppress the HIV mm -hmm. virus. Um, Reagan was in many ways is seen as the great Satan <laughs> among the, mm -hmm. the um, lesbian, gay, um, bisexual, queer and transgender community because literally they did nothing and off and often laughed in the face of all these gay people dying unfortunately well there were a number of conservative christian groups who thought that uh, that this was um a disease sent by god to punish these sinners Oof. which is really really disgusting yes well ben if you're listening to this years later or months later hopefully you're not listening to this as a two-year-old um, <laughs> you know one thing that i hope that you get from these episodes ben is that star trek gives us a path to a future where we don't have to act this way that we can actually treat people better than we did when these episodes were coming <laughs> out like that's the lesson of this ben gets back to the last paragraph of the uh prisoners of geography that i read yeah exactly. we have choice we have we we have choices to how we behave yes. as individuals as societies as governments etc 
And if Ben can take anything from this, I would hope that he would choose to be like Jean-Luc Picard in terms of saying like, okay, these people are sick, but we, we have to do something to help them. We must yes. do something to help. I, right. I, I, that is something that you instilled in me as a child, and I hope to instill in my son. Thank you. I'm glad um, I did. So before we go, um, the mood rose. I, oh yes. I, so I like the mood rose, but they didn't use it beyond that one scene. Well, and I made a comment. I think that it turned when she was holding it, it turned dark blue. And oh. I wondered what I wondered what that that meant. Was there a certain ennui, a certain so I, sadness, or what? So I had to. I actually had to go back and watch this episode today before before the podcast, and. It's actually blue when Wyatt's holding it, but when he hands it to Deanna, it turns ah. white. Ah, interesting. So, I didn't so, pick that up. You know, it seems Wyatt is very sad. Um, that would make sense then, yeah. But when he hands it to Deanna, it, I, I think, you know, what do you think the white color means in terms of Deanna's emotions? Because it seems like Deanna has very, maybe it, she seems, in some ways, very much a neutral party to what's happening to her. She, she I mean, it's this is trite, but she sort of accepted her fate. Yeah, and she was okay with it. Yeah, she, you know, she didn't have anxiety. She didn't have a lot of anxiety about it. And as we're, we knew that uh, Wyatt had, you know, was saying, "This is not what I expected. I think I'll be okay with it, but I don't, I, you know, what." Where's this person that I've been dreaming about for 18, 28 years, however old he was? Maybe, maybe, the, maybe that white color is the absence of any real emotion that Troy feels about it. Because one thing that I think is never really discussed or explored is what is the emotional depth and ability of a beta Z since they have this ability to telepathically key into other people's emotions mm -hmm. but you know that that might be a question for another episode um sure. dad thank you so much for joining me and discussing haven and i think this was a great episode um did did you enjoy it i did yeah i did awesome so uh we'll call it for an evening now uh our next episode is uh i believe it's the big yeah. the the long the, the big goodbye the big goodbye right. yes the big goodbye yeah. so everyone uh thank you for joining us for where no bubs has gone before we'll be back we'll be back next time for the big goodbye uh have a good night dad bye